Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, uh, and you can probably hear I'm from Glasgow, and my English is not so good either, but I'll, I'll do my best, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll try and speak very, very slowly. Uh, okay. Anyway, this is just a wee bit about our company. Uh, we own ferries, ports and harbours really throughout the, the west of Scotland and uh, on, the, on the Clyde. Again, here we're wholly owned by the Scottish Government, with Scottish Ministers, the sole shareholders. So if you know a certain Mr Alex Salmond, our First Minister, that's, that's my boss. That's my boss. <laughs> So anyway, this, this is really the brand name for our company. It's called Caledonian McBrain. Sorry, I'm on the way here. Uh, I don't know if too many have been up in the west coast of Scotland on the Hebrides and, and used the ferries, but that's, that's the brand name. The, the company SEMA and the logo you see up there in the top corner is the name of our company. I'll explain in a minute why, we're, why we've got a new name. But anyway, that's, that's what you see as, see as as. I'm going to skip through a lot of these things because I really do apologise. This is a quite a long presentation and I really need to get it down to the sort of 30 minutes. So I'll try and just skip over some things. But really what happened, there was a restructuring uh, in 2006 whereby we had to split the company into two. One became an asset owning company and one became an operational company. We are the original company. Uh, but we own the assets and they made a new company who operate the vessels, however they still use the brand name because that's what the public recognise. Um, okay, so again, just skip through, think of these, through some of these, this is just some of our main responsibilities. A bit showing the, the organisation, Scottish Ministers, CMAL, that's us, we're the vessel owners. A company down here called Calmac Ferries Limited, who are the actual vessel operator. There's a map of Scotland, you're probably familiar. So that just shows some of the routes that the, the vessels operate. We've got about 30 ships and there's probably about 20, 20 routes that we actually operate out of. The hybrid ferry, which I'm going to talk about, is going to operate on the Isle of Skye. Um, again, Hopefully some of you have been there before, you know what it is. It's going to operate from Sky, which is now obviously linked by a bridge to the mainland. A long time ago there was, there was two ferries run back and forward. But it's going to go to a small island called Rassi. We're building two of these ships and the second of the two ships is scheduled, yet to be confirmed, to go from Largs to, Mil uh, to Cumbria, which is Millport, which is just down the coast uh, from Glasgow. Okay. Just quickly through some of the, sh the ships that we've got. This is the Loch Shearer. This is our newest small ship. It was delivered in 2007. You can all read for yourself here. 36 cars, 250 passengers and can do 18 knots. Just zooming in a bit, bit to that photograph. This is the largest ship in the fleet that we've got. This is the Isle of Lewis, which sails between Ullapool and Stornoway and can carry 123 cars. 1,700 passengers and can do 18 knots. We've actually got plans to actually replace this vessel. I can't remember if this presentation shows the actual, the new ship, but we just placed an order on Thursday there with a German shipyard called Flensburger for a new vessel at the cost of 50 million euros. Another one of our ships, this is the, the Klansman, which is sailing actually out of the north end of Skye. And at the lower end of the scale, this is our smallest ship. Uh, this ship's about 35 years old and is getting towards the end of its life. And the intention will be that these new hybrid vessels will replace this type of vessel. But if we see here, it's only got six cars, whereby the new vessels have got much bigger capacity. This is the latest uh, vessel we took delivery of last year, the Finlagen, uh, and this sails to to Eilie, where we, where we make the whiskey. So that's an important ship. <laughs> All right. Again, I think it was yourself that actually touched on, you know, the, the climate change delivery plan. Again, same idea, Scottish target of 34%. But where we come in really is here. And this, this again is for the transport sector. By 2020, even though we've got this overall 34% target, by 2020, the requirement uh, 
for shipping is just for 20 per cent. It's a 5 to 10 through technology measurements and 10 per cent reduction through demand, i.e. <laughs> less, less sailings. You know. uh, so that was our target, is to try and see how the new design of ship, which we need to replace the old ships, how we can get at least 20 per cent savings in our uh, CO2 emissions. Anyway, I do have some slides of our new ship, so I'll just put these in just so quickly. Are there, Mandatory, we've got to meet them. And given that you know Scottish government are our, our shareholder, we're wholly owned we, yeah, you yeah, know. So, yeah, and, and obviously you know Scottish government got some big big targets for renewables. Again, that's just a nice pretty 3D render of the ship that uh, we haven't even really finally designed yet, but that's what it's going to look like and it'll be delivered in two years. So uh, we're, we're, we're very, very pleased with this ship. Again, this ship, uh, I don't know if I've got anything on there, but, but that's needing seven megawatt of propulsion power. So it's a wee bit different from <laughs> the smaller ship that I'm going to, I'm going to speak about. So anyway, on to the actual main subject, which is uh, our small hybrid ferries. Uh, just a bit about rules and regulations. We do call this the world's first seagoing passenger rural vehicle ferry, whatever we call it, because it is. But we put in that many words just to, just to be clear, because you know there's lots of hybrid ferries out there that are world's first. But as far as a passenger vehicle ferry, which is roll on, roll off, this is, we believe, uh, the first. And again, <laughs> some of the same things coming up here. A passenger ship can carry more than you know 12, 12 passengers. Again, because we are not operating in inland waters or categorised waters, we are actually building sea-going vessels here. So th there's various categories of, of sea-going vessels. There's an EC directive. Uh, again, I, I saw on your jazz was the MSN 1823. That's for the inland. We build ships to the EC, EC directive. There's a lot, a lot of similarities, but the EC directive has a lot more strict sort of regulations that we have to, we have to meet. So we are building a classed C ship, and that's just a brief sort of description of what a class C ship should be. Okay, and, and uh, on domestic voyage routes. Okay, one one of the big problems about designing this ship was in accordance with the new rules. Even though it's a relatively small ship for us, uh, we have to fit a double bottom right throughout the ship. Uh, and what that does, you know, it just makes it a difficult space to maintain. It adds weight. We have to have an increased bilge system for the spaces above, the spaces below. And the big thing it does, it reduces headroom in the ship. You know, that's, so, so it's a huge problem having to, having to build this. A double bottom in here, but we have to do this to meet the rules. Although all our existing vessels, which have been going back and forward on these routes for a hundred years, don't have any double bottoms. But the rules are the rules, so that's what we've. New this is what we've, this is the, the new rules, so this is what we've got to do. Again, same thing here with a lot of these kind of interesting projects. It attracts a, a whole lot of uh, media attention especially the one there in, in the middle of the BBC. They came up and did a whole lot of filming in the yard that we're building. And uh, you can see that on the BBC World News Channel if you're ever, ever watching. Anyway, some of the main particulars of the ship. The overall length is 43.5 metres. The length between perpendiculars is 39.99 metres. And we'll make sure when we build the ship and we measure it that it is 39.99 metres. Because if we build a ship that's over 40 metres, it's a whole new set of rules that kick in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so it's very, very important that we, that we, keep, it, we keep it below the, we, we keep it below the 40 metres. Is that in winter or summer? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's, that's absolutely true. I've got a suntan, do you know that? Uh, anyway, and the, the dead weight for this ship is 135 tonnes, so that's what we can carry in, in the way of um, cargo. That's quite a lot for a small ship that's only going to carry 23 cars. If we take what the average weight of a car being 1.5 tonnes, Carrying 135 tonnes is unlikely, 
but it's the ship has been designed to carry two fully loaded HGVs plus some other cars, plus the fuel, plus 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 the passengers. Obviously, a bit of growth margin in there as well. But our typical kind of cargo weight is going to be probably about 10, 12 tons, maybe 20. And that has a big impact on how we sized our systems and how we try to optimise it because we're building a ship for different operating conditions and we had to consider that basically most of the time will be lightly loaded. And obviously for lightly loaded, we, we need basically less power to put the ship through the water. Anyway, just another wee graphical representation of the vessel. Uh, all, all our small ships and basically come up to a one in eight concrete slipway. So when, when, we, when we lower the ramps to let, to let the vehicles off, we don't tie up, we don't moor. And what we do is we basically use the aft propulsion unit just to, just to hold ourselves uh, on station. So we're always using power and we're always using propulsion power at all stages. Uh, the only thing at this, at this point when we're actually offloading on the existing vessels, which are diesel mechanical, we're running the diesels very, very, very lightly loaded. So anyway, we, obviously before we designed the ship, we thought we'd like to find out how much power we need to actually put it through the water. So we conducted some model tests at the HSVA tank in Hamburg. And that was the results from the model test that, that our operating draft of 1.73, which is our 135 tonnes of cargo, we will need a, a power at the propeller of 267.5 kilowatts. Uh, so anyway, just going back to that one there. So that's our propulsion power to put the ship through, through the water, 267 kilowatts. But we actually have a total propulsion power of 750 kilowatts installed. So it looks as if we've got an overcapacity, but we've got that there in place for the worst weather conditions, as you could possibly imagine, <laughs> where these ships can operate. So normally, for a normal typical day, we need that 267, but we need this power in reserve for bad weather. Uh, you wouldn't sail the ship in those kind of conditions, but it's just in case you are sailing the, the ship in those conditions, you need, you need the power. I mean, we wouldn't be allowed because a Euro Sea ship wouldn't be allowed to actually sail in those kind of conditions. Um, so, where was I there? So we've got 750 kilowatt of installed power. Maybe everyone knows these kind of things here, but just the differences in when we're looking at power. I find that even some naval architects get mixed up at times. But uh, now our PD is uh, power delivered actually at the propeller. But what we were interested in our surveys, uh, our uh, you know investigations was what do we have to deliver at the actual main engine, the PB? Okay. So I'll just try and move on quickly here because I've got a lot in here. Uh, so when we started looking at this new ship, we looked really at three systems. One was diesel mechanical diesel, electric, and some kind of hybrid system. First thing we did was we carried out some um, power, uh, took, took some power readings on one of the existing vessels, and hopefully this makes sense. But what we found is because we had this 750 kilowatts of power there just in case, we have to provide that available power for it. But most of the time, we were never using that 750 kilowatts. We were always a way, way down here. And if, and if you see here, you know, for 24% of the time, we were only using between 6 and 10% of the available power. So all the time, the engine's lightly, lightly loaded. Uh, and only, only, you know, for 3% of the time do we even go over 50% of the engine rating on a typical day. So... Anyway, this is just a quick sketch of our typical diesel mechanical system. We're all pretty familiar with that. Direct diesel engine shaft feeding a propulsion unit. This is diesel electric. Uh, so rather than having the two uh, diesel engines, we thought about three generators and two variable speed uh, electric motors to, to drive the propulsion system. So we looked at that, then we looked at the operational profile of the actual route. So again, this was a timetable for the Sconsor Rassi route. So a typical transit time was 20 minutes, manoeuvring time for the ship was about 2 minutes, and manoeuvring for us is just slowing the ship down when you approach 
the slipway. So it's not, there's not a, an increased power required there or whatever. And again, typically we can be at the slip for between 8 and 23 minutes. The 23 minutes, I think, is just one occasion during the day when we might be taking bunkers or something like that. But typically it's about 8 minutes that we'll be sitting there. So from that, and, our, and based upon our model test predictions, we worked out basically how much energy this vessel, this new vessel was going to require for it throughout the day. So we came up with a figure of 2,600 kilowatt hours. But one of the, un uh, the other things that we noticed was 36% of the operational day with engines running would be sitting at the slip, really, really lightly loaded, just burning fuel. So anyway, we realised that wasn't a good thing. We then looked at some engine loadings for a diesel mechanical setup. Uh, and as you can see, even for the nine knot condition, we're sitting about 32% on the engines when we're manoeuvring 14 and we're actually, when we're at port, we're 9%, very, very low. So our estimated fuel consumption there was 548 litres per day. When we looked at the diesel electric, now when I first started looking at this diesel electric, because of the losses in the system compared to just a diesel engine driving a propulsion unit, I wasn't sure if the diesel electric was actually going to be, in, would, would improve in those figures, but because of the, the actual loadings on the, on the diesel generators being so better and the specific fuel oil consumption being much improved at those figures, we were actually saving fuel just by going, not much fuel, but saving fuel just by going to diesel electric. So anyway, that's a quick comparison, showing for a diesel mechanical, 548, diesel electric, 538. But the big thing really was the percentage loading on the engines. And what we're doing here with the diesel electric, when it's 89%, it's 89% on one generator. And the other two generators are there on standby, really when we need this 750 kilowatts of load. So we're only using one machine out of three at a nice sweet point, whereby for diesel mechanical, we're actually 32% on two engines running all day long. So the maintenance is up. Uh, uh, and everything else that goes along with that. So diesel electric was a winner right away, without a doubt, it was absolutely the winner. So anyway, when we started thinking about, all right, how do we, how do we, how do we improve on this system? So we did think about gas, we did think about fuel cells. This, we started this project three years ago, but we did have a demand to actually put a ship on the route. So this isn't a concept, this is like a real vessel that's needed for a real purpose. It's a lifeline ferry service. So we've got to provide the ferry. So we, we kind of had to quickly move on and basically shelf all these ideals for fuel cells and for LNG. And that's one of the main reasons sorry, why I'm here today is because what we want to do is take this project and move it on. You know, we're actually building these ones, but we want to move it to the next stage. So I'm kind of hoping there'll be people here in this audience that can come up and talk to me after this and say, we can help you. You know, that's what we're really looking for is just basically advice to be informed about where to take this next. So anyway, we looked at adding some batteries onto the system. Again, based upon this 20% kind of reduction in our fuel and our emissions, and going back to my total kilowatt hours of about 2,600 kilowatts, we, we said to ourselves, well, we could, could we fit in 750 kilowatt hours worth of batteries? And that would give us 25, 30% of the energy coming from the batteries. So that was the first way I thought about doing it, was just connect the batteries onto this AC bus and let the energy flow through this way. But again, lots of conversions by doing it that way, so therefore more losses. So what you're gaining your 20% by using your batteries, you could end up having losses all over the system with further conversions. So what we thought about doing here, was just connect them straight right onto the DC link of that variable speed drive. Absolutely no conversion required at all. And that was the only bit that I've got to say that I was completely unfamiliar with because I'd never done it before. I'd done everything else before, but I'd never, never done it this way. So we spoke to a lot of suppliers, drive suppliers, battery suppliers such as SAFT and a company in Canada, Corvus, Valence, one in Finland, European Batteries all pretty major suppliers and we spoke to them and we spoke to the drive suppliers and we said can we do this and yes was the answer so just a straightforward connection onto the batteries and these basically become solid state generators 
I'll just skip over this quickly, but this is obviously another thing, just part of our studies, just looking at various conditions. It's maybe difficult to read, but you know, if we're looking at, you know, if the ship's sailing at nine knots, if it's sailing at eight knots, 8.5, eight knots, if we've got a 15% sea margin or not, we looked at all the different powers we would need for the ship so that we knew that regardless of the conditions, the speed the vessel was doing, we would always be sitting at a nice kind of point on the engine loading. So that, that, that proved to us that we could do it for various kind of operating conditions. Again, just some further fuel calculations. I'll just skip over them. Anyway, this is just how the system actually looks. Three Volvo Penta generators here. Shore supply, we'll talk about that in a minute. Electrical switchboard, two variable speed drives, electric propulsion motors feeding voice propeller units. Just here a wee bit about the system voltages. 400 volts is a generating uh, supply from the generators uh, and the battery voltage has to sit above the voltage level of the DC link because obviously for putting 400 volts in AC to get DC out, we're obviously raising the voltage by, you know, the 400 volts times the square root of two. So we have to keep the battery voltage fairly, fairly high. Again, the lithium ion battery is directly connected to DC link. No additional electronics or voltage conversions required. Anyway, that's our targets that will use at least 20% less fuel than a diesel mechanical propulsion system. We know it's going to be more than 20%, but you don't want to give that away right away, you know, so if we get 20%, we'd we'll be very, very happy, but we've got a feeling we'll achieve a whole lot more than 20%. Again, uh, at lower speeds and lightly loaded conditions, that 20% is for the ship doing nine knots fully loaded, but at lower speeds and lighter loaded conditions, we'll, we'll make greater savings. And on days with reduced numbers of sailings, it will be possible to operate on batteries only for some crossings. Uh, and again, import the vessel capable of operating on batteries only. Anyway, I think we all know these things. We can skip over them very, very quickly. I think they've been discussed today. So anyway, this is just a, a simple arrangement drawing of, of the ship, showing the location of all the items. Propulsion motor close coupled to the, the voice units. Two separate battery compartments shown here in yellow uh, and the electrical switchboards and generators in two engine rooms. Anyway, uh, just a, a picture of, of the generator. What we even found from when we first started the project, uh, again, as I said, three years ago, we were looking at specific fuel oil consumption figures from the engine suppliers then at about 203 grams per kilowatt hour. And only when we actually went to order the ship with the shipyard and order the, the engines, this is now what we're being offered here from the engine suppliers is a much more fuel efficient engine. So we've saved 5% already just by using uh, the latest in, uh, engine technology. Again, for the electrical people in here, we've got a 0.9 power factor because the electric propulsion system is the main load on the ship, so it's working at that, that higher power factor. Again, weight, I've probably not touched on weight too much, but you know the weight of these engines is 3185. Because we've gone from a diesel mechanical system to diesel electric plus the batteries, that was something that we really had to consider in the design of the ship. Uh, so well, the weight has been carefully, carefully managed and we've offset some of the, of the weight with the equipment by adding aluminium uh, into the superstructure. Again, picture of the, the variable speed drive here. High power factor, efficiency is pretty good, 98%. I'm still waiting for a, a weight on that. For the propulsion motors we're using, this is a Siemens. Sorry, it's ABB. <laughs> Sorry, it was going to be Siemens. We're using an ABB permanent magnet uh, motor. Kind of new for me as well. I've never, I've never fitted a one ship's permanent magnet motor, so very, very new. Uh, so I can only take the figures from, from what suppliers are telling me. This is what's printed on the data sheets, saying, you know, we've got an efficiency of 97%. I saw in some earlier presentation that was something about 89% for a, a permanent. Well, that's, that's what we're told, 97%. 
Again, and we know we know the benefits: no no gearbox, space and weight saving, which was very very important to us. Higher efficiency and higher power factor. It's a picture of our voith units. Um, because we're, we're coming up to these one and eight slipways and the tides up and down and the ships moving about, these are pretty robust, these things, and, and they can take impact. If we're there with a standard propeller and we damage it, we're into dry dock, lifeline ferry service. At least with these ships, we can actually, we can actually change them when the ship's afloat and we can actually change, if we just damage one blade, we can change a blade. But again, they're, very, they're fantastic units, they're highly manoeuvrable. Anyway, just a bit about the batteries. I'll just try and quickly go through these. Uh, that's basically the, the standard battery, what it will look like. At, 20, uh, at what's the voltage? The nominal voltage is 12.8 volts. So that's going to give us 3.5 kilowatt hours worth of energy. Then what we'll do is we'll then put them into a series in parallel uh, configuration in order to give us Sorry, <laughs> to give us the voltage we're looking for, uh, nominal voltage of 691 uh, volts. And the important things to look at is here is basically the weight. This is for one propulsion system. We've got one battery bank feeding uh, the forward system and one battery bank feeding the after system. So that weight we've got there is times two. A bit there about depth of discharge and uh, number of cycles. Again, a lot of this is new technology. We've been to all these battery companies throughout Europe and we've asked them questions that they can't even answer. So, so a lot of it's for getting into the unknown we, and, and we realise that. Okay, so that's, that's what the battery bank will, will eventually look like. Okay, there'll be, there'll be two sets of them with four to four batteries in series. And the reason, again, we picked this 350 kilowatt hours times two, it just suited everything that we were doing. It suited how much we could afford to pay for batteries, the size, the weight, and basically we have to charge them and we have to discharge them as well. And again, the battery costs, they've not dropped enough, but they've certainly dropped since we first started looking at this three years ago. Uh, the design life for those batteries? The design life? Well, what do you expect them to allow or do you expect them to allow? Depends how you use them. Uh, we're told that the actual calendar life is 30 years. 30 years. 30 years, that's a calendar life. You know, basically yeah. sit it on the shelf yeah. and, and, and it's there for 30 years. The way, the way we're going to treat the batteries, we're going to steadily discharge the batteries throughout the course of the operational day. So the ship typically is in operation for about 12, 10 to 12 hours. We're just going to take that battery energy out very, very steadily over the day. So it's a, it's a nice, smooth discharge. And also, I've got a few slides which will which come on to you about how we're going to charge them. So we're going to treat them with the, the most care that we can. We're going to discharge them to 80%. You can go lower, but we're going to just go to 80% so that we can hopefully increase the, the lifetime of the batteries. What the battery suppliers are saying, we can get 3,000 cycles. 3,000 cycles, they say you can get even treating the bad batteries pretty harshly. You know, worst operating temperatures, you know, taking all the energy out in one hour, charging them up in one hour. We're told you can get 3,000 cycles, which, so even with those kind of harsh kind of requirements, that would last us 10 years. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, total weight for the system is about 7,000 kilograms for the batteries, which is about, you know, the weight of four to five cars. So we had to find ways in the ship to, to compensate for, for that increase in weight. Uh, Basically, what we want to make sure we do for the operator of, of the vessel, uh, even though these are seagoing vessels, because we keep them below a certain gross tonnage, because we keep them below a certain propulsion power, that 750 kilowatt is an important figure because we don't need any trained uh, certified engineers on the vessels. And the, the, the skipper, just he'll be a, a, a boatmaster rather than a, a full seagoing skipper. Because at the moment, they're easy to fix, two diesels, shaft, everything straightforward. We have taken a gigantic step forward. We didn't even just introduce the diesel electric. That would, be, that would have been enough for them. You know, just diesel electric can't even do that. So it's like we've gone from diesel mechanical, he checks the oil, he checks the fuel, he checks the water, and he goes away and he maintains the engines. So we've gone with this 
But from an operational point of view as well, we can't give him any additional controls that he doesn't have at the moment. So it will be the same, same bridge control panel, just with a few additional displays, as you would say if it was a car or a bus, just giving them a bit of information on the batteries. But as far as the operation of the batteries and the generators goes, the power management system does that for him. He doesn't even have to know what's going on down below. OK, this was just a, a comparison uh, of batteries from, from, uh, from our findings. Uh, some lithium-ion battery manufacturers will tell you you can get 8,000 cycles. Uh, and again, the, the charge efficiency was another thing because our intention is, is we use the battery power during the day and charge them up overnight. But there's no point in using that energy if you have to put so much more energy in at night. Um, again, in maintenance free. Just a bit about our, our voltage levels. I think I touched on that earlier on, just to keep us above the, the limit on that DC link. Very, very quickly, I think someone else touched on point battery management systems. That's a, that's a key to the whole thing working. Uh, and again, our ship will be tied up, it will be tied up overnight and there will always be power on, on the ship so everything will be monitored continuously as well as having the batteries for propulsion, we've got UPSs for all the electronics so basically nothing, nothing is switched off. One of the main uh, considerations really is safe working in battery isolation because in those compartments we've got 700 volts DC so so, so we had to think carefully about how we manage that because if you ever have to go in and remove a battery, you can't switch the whole system off. A generator, you can, you can, you can switch it off and you've not got any voltage. A battery system is live. So we've had to think very, very carefully about how we take care of safe isolation. And we're basically going to do that through a whole series of contactors and switches so that we can reduce the voltage so that anywhere with, between arm's length, length will keep below a safe working voltage. Anyway, I think as I just touched on as well, we'll have an energy management system which will control the actual the, the balance between what the batteries are supplying and what the generators are supplying. Because obviously the ship, the profile of the ship might change from one day to another depending on conditions, depending on cargo. But what we want to do at the end of the day is take as much energy from the batteries as we possibly can. We want to discharge them to the maximum allowable. Because if we do that, that's us saving as much fuel as we possibly can. Another useful uh, point about this whole uh, habit, having the batteries and having the diesel electric, we now have basically five sources of power on the ship. Before we had two, we had two diesel engines, and if we lost one diesel engine, the ship was taken out of service. Now, by having the five sources of power, we can always sail the ship, even if we've, maybe if, if the batteries aren't available, we can still sail the ship. If we've lost a generator, we can still sail the ship. And the, the other beauty thing is if we have a total failure of the ship, say when we're coming along to the slipway or the key wall, that basically there'll always be power available in the batteries, even at the last sailing at the, at the end of the day. So if the ship blacks out, it will switch immediately to batteries and basically allow us to clear the danger. Anyway, we'll, we'll have basically four modes of operation for this ship. One is what we call generator mode, where the generator will feed the power through to the propulsion motor and feed the, the power through to the, the hotel load, ship's lights and, and heating. And even for this ship, it's not substantial for us. Uh, my estimate's about 20 kilowatts for the general kind of standing load on the ship. So that's generator mode. This is generator in battery modes and basically the power will flow from the generators, but the power at this stage will flow from the batteries down through to the propulsion motor. So they'll be, they'll be working in parallel at, at that point. And again, we can have different combinations, whether we take 50% you know, from the batteries, 50% from the generators, 80% from the, 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 the batteries, 20% from the generators, or vice versa. We, the, the energy management system will take care of all that for us. <laughs> 